So very much welcome to this panel. I will, would like to say a few words to, to kick off the discussion and then I will invite each of you to make an intervention of five, six minutes and after that we will have a discussion and invite questions from the floor as well. When we talk about um, investments in landscapes for green returns. There are a number of things that we need to clarify, of course, and I, I hope that our panel can shed some light on the concepts within those terms and also what considerations, limitations, and also opportunities that we can find. We have throughout this conference so far discussed uh, investments in sustainable landscapes, investments in forestry, a big discussion here is obviously to what extent does the public sector need to be involved and to what extent can we rely on the private sector. The climate change negotiations are aiming for a very ambitious contribution of public funds. The, the target is set at 100 billion US dollars per year by 2020. Now this sounds like a lot of money. And it represents, rather precisely, 0.1% of the world economy in 2020. So to me, it sounds quite obvious that we can only hope and expect that the Green Climate Fund can leverage much larger investments from the private sector, from the private finance sector. This is one uh, perspective. Another is, um, when we talk about returns, we talk about money. Um, from a finance perspective, this is very clear. I also believe and expect and hope that those returns can be shifted to more sustainable practices. And I also think that that does not necessarily mean lower returns. We may well have higher returns also in a sustainable venture compared to business as usual. So this is another debate that we're having. When we talk about the green economy, often the economists look at the word green and they say, oh, green means lower, lower profits. And the green people look at the word economy and they say, oh, economy, that means that we have uh, less sustainability. I don't think that's necessarily true. And I will be curious to hear the panel's view on this as well. And then there are, of course, many issues in, 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 in the arrangements around investments in sustainable land use, sustainable landscapes. Can we bring down the transaction cost to reasonable levels of the finance, finance transactions? Can we bring down the costs of verification of the sustainability outcomes to a reasonable level? Can we uphold the ethics and, and the social responsibilities in these investments? And finally, most importantly, can we provide the returns that large-scale private finance would expect over the long term? These are some of, some of the big questions that we're operating with. So, with no further ado, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Ranavana from, from the Asian Development Bank. What are your perspectives and, and ambitions and, and visions in, in, uh, in, in, in this area? Please okay. go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you. So good morning or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a pleasure to be on this panel. And um, um, on behalf of the ADB, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting us to be here. So one of the questions that has been posed to this panel is how can public finance be used more effectively to leverage private investment into, in sustainable landscape management? And before we answer that question, I, I think it's important to ask why that question has been posed in the first place. So take, for instance, a gathering of uh, pulpwood industry or um, palm oil industry or, or rubber industry, do you think they would be sitting around in large gatherings like this, thousands of them, asking that same question as to how public investment supports their investment in pulpwood or, or palm oil? 
I don't think so. <clears throat> Instead, they are out there securing the next land concession to go out and develop the next, open up out, a new plantation. Um, and they're often doing this in remote parts of countries where there isn't infrastructure. And they're not asking governments how can governments help them. Instead, they're doing that infrastructure themselves. They're putting in infrastructure, and for good measure, they're throwing in some additional infrastructure as a token of appreciation for, to the government for having given them that land concession. So the question I ask is, what's different between them and, and us? And the big difference is that in the case of pulp wood or palm oil or coffee or soybean, the private sector that's dealing with those are dealing with a commodity that has a real price in a real market. And those commodities are fetching enormous financial returns, is what, which is what drives the private sector. So if we are serious about investing uh, or in encouraging the private sector to invest in, in natural capital, in sustaining landscapes, then we need to be able to present the private sector with the comparable returns from investing in sustainable landscapes as the returns they would get from any other investment in that landscape. In other words, the goods and services from managing an, a landscape, the natural capital, should be comparable to the, the returns from coffee or soybean or, or palm oil. They need to be able to compare apples with apples, not apples with lemons. Now, so, it, but this is easier said than done. As we all know, the problem is that ecosystem services are difficult to quantify, difficult to value, it's difficult to assign prices and then to develop mechanisms to, to actually trade on those. <coughs> So that brings me to the question, what is the role of public finance in, in supporting private sector to invest in, in landscapes? So the role of public finance should really be to, to create the enabling conditions that allow the private sector to consider investing in sustainable landscape management as a comparable investment to investing in some other commodity. Um, and so the 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 role of the, pu the public finance should then be providing those conditions. Now, the, the trend, the, the traditional or the, the historical trend in this case in, in the public investment has been to support investments in landscape conservation, the public finance. And when I talk about public finance here, I'm talking more generally about finance from governments as well as ODA, Overseas Development Assistance, which includes finance from Asian Development Bank, which I represent. So our, the trend has been to, to invest in, in conservation initiatives uh, directly. Um, and this has been useful because first, it demonstrates the case to the private sector that there are viable business models in sustainable landscape management. And secondly, it has often been the stopgap measure that has prevented a tide of change of land uses over, over a landscape and, and actually bought some time until some more sustainable financing can be, be secured. Just before coming out here, I was with, in the Harapan rainforest, which many of you might know, in central and south, south Sumatra. And I've seen firsthand the, the challenges that Harapan rainforest faces uh, in terms of grappling with the competing land uses, in that case, palm oil plantations. Harapan represents one of the few remaining bits of lowland rainforest in Sumatra, and it's, a, it's an island of rich biodiversity sitting in a sea or an ocean of, of palm oil and acacia plantations. And had it not been for this consortium of NGOs that got together and got a concession to, to maintain and to to manage that as an ecosystem restoration project, Harapan today would also be an acacia plantation. So, um, so if, if one is looking for an example of, of the importance of conservation work, um, Harapan presents a classic example of why that's important. Uh, but public finance or even donor finance, as, is, as was the case in Harapan, is not a sustainable mechanism for financing conservation work or landscape, sustainable landscape work in perpetuity. 
Instead, the, the funding for conservation and for managing sustainable landscapes should come from the returns that you generate from managing those landscapes. And here again, I think we can turn to the private sector to, for lessons. For instance, the private sector is very good at managing its capital, financial capital. So if you have some financial assets, what do you do? You go to a bank or you go to an asset manager and you pay this man asset manager a handsome fee to manage your capital and to generate returns from it. So in the same way, why don't we pay those who manage our natural capital a fee for managing uh, those, those assets? If the capital stocks in a landscape can be measured, quantified, valued, and a, and a percentage of that asset value be assigned as a management fee, I'm sure the private sector would find that a very viable business proposition. Similarly, the, these ecosystems generate, just like financial capital generates returns from interest or, or revenue from um, earnings, these landscapes generate returns in the way of sustainable ecosystem service flows. And again, if these services, the flows of those services can be monitored, uh, captured, quantified and valued and the end users of those services be identified, be they global consumers of say, carbon sinks or local consumers of water supply or, or irrigation or hydropower operators, then they should be paying for those services. So in other words, the private sector has has developed models on how to manage capital, and I think we can learn from those and, and identify ways that money, uh, the private sector could also similarly get involved in managing natural capital. So in summing up, I think in addition to public investment going into implementation of conservation landscape work, um, it's also important that public investment goes into creating the enabling conditions that would make, allow the private sector to compete or to come in and invest in natural, uh, in landscapes conservation work. And so pu public investment should go into creating the policy regimes or the regulatory regimes, public investments, public finance should go into looking at fiscal instruments, uh, addressing distorting taxes or, or incentives which might tip the playing field away from, against investing in landscapes, in ecosystems, or, or creating incentives to create the, to even the playing field and promote conservation. Uh, public finance should also go into research to be able to, first to better understand the ecosystem services and the values that we generate from them. It should go into awareness, information, and education to create in, you know, improved awareness about the importance of ecosystems. So in summing up, I would say that if we are to attract private sector to address investing or to invest in, in landscapes for sustainable management of landscapes, we need to raise the game and we need to level the playing field and, and the role of public finance should be in addressing those needs squarely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I'll park a, th a question for you for the next round and that is, based on what you're saying, um, I don't detect any major role of direct investment from the public sector. Um, I'd like you to think about that until the next round and see if you have any, any comments on that. Now, Mr. Saputo, so, yes. Yes. Um, you represent a very interesting initiative that we would very much like to hear more about because you're directly focusing on investments in uh, sustainable landscapes. And I, th I think you may have made a handout available as well. Yes. And we can say a few words about that too. Sure, please. Sure. Thank you, Peter. Um, before I start, I want to make sure that everyone gets a copy of our handouts. This, we have handouts on Green Prosperity Project, and second is a handout on uh, landscape, our landscape approach. If uh, you, don't, you haven't got a copy, please raise your hand. Uh, I think <coughs> my team will be able to attend to you and deliver that copies. I think, Peter, you have a copy? Dr. Ngai? <clears throat> um, thank you for uh, this wonderful opportunity for sharing about how MCA Indonesia is investing in landscape for green returns. Uh, but before I start with 
how we are doing it. I'd like to explain just very little about what MCA Indonesia is. MCA Indonesia stands for Millennium Challenge Account Indonesia. is an entity, is an institution that established specifically to implement and execute this partnership program between U.S. and Indonesia. We receive a grant from the U.S. and U.S. in this case represented by MCC, Millennium Challenge Corporation, and from the Indonesia side, uh, the leading agencies are Bapenas and Minister of Finance. So MC Indonesia is an independent entity that's established to run this, to implement this program. Um, we have three programs within this uh, partnership, and I think one of them that's most relevant and most interesting for this audience is the green prosperity. And indeed, uh, our approach to invest is landscape approach. Now, let me start with the principles or the philosophy of, of GP, or Green Prosperity Project or Program. Um, to, in a nutshell, I would say that this GP, or Green Prosperity, is an interaction, is an intersection or confluence between two pillars. The first one is the management of environment surrounding the investment. The second one is the sustainable economic growth. These two, the intersection of these two is what we call the sweet spot where we are designing how we design the Green Prosperity Program. And then <clears throat> the principles, I would offer uh, three S's that underlies the uh, principle how we design the program. The first S is the sources of the input, natural inputs, the sources of natural input, that's the first S. The second is safeguards, safeguards against negative effect of investments. And the third is, the third S is social inclusivity, to make sure that uh, to avoid divisive social jealousy for not included in the investment. Because we look at this landscape, not only a landscape of a lifeless landscape, but landscape together with lifescape, the people around, the people in that landscape, the livelihood of the people. So this is the approach that we are taking. And above all, or probably underlying all these three S's uh, is one big S, which is the spatial, spatial certainty. Because we believe that without spatial certainty, our investment will, will, be, will go nowhere, because we have no spatial certainty um, on, on what we are going to do in the areas. Um, now, Based on these principles, then we designed this GP investment, or Green Prosperity Investments, in two sectors, two main sectors. The first one is renewable energy, and second is sustainable natural resource management. So what we are doing is for, we are now, we have identified landscapes from in several provinces in Indonesia, and then within these landscapes, we go into the landscapes, bearing in mind the three S's and one big S, and then we look at what can we do in terms of renewable energy, what can we do in terms of sustainable natural resource management. Of course, other investments, these, these two are not the only investments, but we decided to focus on these two, at least for the first uh, part of this program. And then next, we will open, as because MC Indonesia is a granting uh, institution, we will open um, windows. There are four windows that we are going to open. Uh, we'll start to open the first window in July, and the rest of the windows will be open um, by the end of the year. So we'll start with four windows, uh, the first window 
of grant and so on and so forth. Um, so we'll have a big announcement in July. But then <clears throat> let me share with you the aha moment when we start, when develop this GP uh, project. This happens about three or four years ago during the formative years of GP. Uh, when our team went to visit a village in Karin, in uh, uh, Merangin, Kabupaten Merangin, in the province of Jambi. We went there and we talked to the villagers, the head of the village. They actually learned the need that they need renewable energy, they need power. So they actually installed a small a micro hydro installations. Uh, it's only 100 kilowatt. And then the head of the village actually confessed, admitted, we used to be illegal loggers, but we are doing it no more. Because we realized that if we keep doing this, we won't have power for our micro hydro. And this is the aha moment for, for our team. Wow, this is it. This is GP. That defines GP. So these people understand without, you know, just naturally understand, if we don't keep the upper catchment area, we won't have power for our micro hydro. We won't have power to dry our coffee beans. We won't have uh, power to dry our um, products. So, so this is the uh, aha moment that defines this green prosperity. So with that, I will uh, hand it over to you, Peter. And of course, I would be happy to entertain questions later. Thank Great. You. Thank you very much, Zaf. So I'll park a question with you also. Sure. And, and it's all very interesting and proactive, what you're mm -hmm. saying. My, my question is that if uh, these um, investments mm -hmm. relate to relatively small-scale ventures. Mm -hmm. um, a, how do you define the verification measures that would apply to be compliant with, with the access to this capital? And B, how would you keep the costs down so that the, the transaction of, of these investments uh, are, are, are uh, transaction costs are reasonable? I'll park that thought sure. with you, and we can take it in the next round. Thank you. Now, Hilde, um, we are from the same part of the world, and um, um, I was uh, intrigued by reading in newspapers from my country, Sweden, about some of the uh, forest industry companies doing businesses that didn't sound totally ethical, at least in the newspaper. I don't know the real story, but uh, I know the newspaper story. And um, what, what happened was um, that the uh, investment, the financial investors behind these industries were starting to think whether they should continue to invest because they had discovered a variety of issues, uh, child labor, social inequities, etc., in developing countries as a result of investments. I think this is what you are engaged in quite a lot. So I'm really curious to hear, when we involve large-scale finance, we know that they're interested in keeping the ethics up, but how do we actually do it? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit about our work. Um, but before going into the specifics, Peter, I think it's uh, Useful just to say a few words. Am I? Thank you. Is there something wrong here? No, it's something just if you wrong. hold it or something. It's Shall I hold it? Some noise. You can put it in your yeah. pocket. I don't have a pocket. <laughs> 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 okay, okay. I, so I think it's useful just to say a little bit about. Doesn't work. A few words about the, uh, the pension fund and the Council on Ethics. I'm keeping this very still. Uh, there's something else coming on. May I keep it? Is there a, another microphone? You want to you 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 keep it for me? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, the Norwegian Government Pension Fund is a sovereign wealth fund uh, and is invested in equities, bonds, and real estate. Uh, the fund's market value is about 800 billion US dollars 
and it's currently a um, shareholder in 8,500 companies worldwide. So it's a big fund. And the fund as, a, as such is not invested in landscapes, but in companies that change the landscape. Would, would you like to try with that one instead? Yeah. It's on? Okay. So the fund is owned by the Ministry of Finance on behalf of the Norwegian people and it's managed by NBIM, which is the uh, investment management arm of the, of the central bank. Now the Council on Ethics, where I work, uh, is not an investor. It's an independent advisory board to the Ministry of Finance on the exclusion of companies from the fund. So we're actually a an, uh, an divestment advisory body. So companies can be excluded from the fund if there is an unacceptable risk that they cause severe environmental um, degradation, gross corruptions, or severe human rights violation. And uh, the ministry decides whether or not to exclude from the company, the company from the fund. We're only advisor uh, because the ministry is the owner of the fund, and the council. The Council's recommendations as well as the Ministry's decisions are made public. So the Council's recommendation to exclude a company is based on quite thorough research and concrete assessments of the company's actions on the ground. Um, our findings are documented in a quite detailed report or a draft recommendation and we send it to the company always to uh, have their comments and give them the opportunity just to provide additional information which they find relevant to the case. And of course we assess the response and we assess whether there's still grounds for exclusion of the company and if there is, we submit a recommendation to the Ministry. So we do work on a number of sectors and companies, including companies involved in the logging and clearing of tropical forests. And um, depending on how these operations are carried out, we think that uh, these kind of activities can actually cause quite severe environmental damage and of course also human rights viola violations and as such be uh, inconsistent with the guidelines of the fund. I'm just going to say very few words about how we go about. In 2011 we identified all the companies in the fund which actually were involved in, um, in, for in plantation or, 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 or forest logging. We wrote to the companies, we requested information about the environmental impacts of their operations, uh, including concession maps, environmental impact assessment, HCV assessments, uh, and to what extent the uh, concession was covered by uh, peatlands or forests. And not only primary forests, but also secondary forests. And uh, some companies did not respond, they um, just simply never answered us. Uh, some provided very limited information and uh, referred us to their website where, where there was hardly any available in, uh, information. And some submitted full reports and, and tons of documents actually with high quality on, on the reports. And based on this information and our own research, and we do, we do use satellite images to see what's in going on in the concession, we do field visits, we use a number of local consultants, um, based on these, we try to find out what the reality is in the individual concession. So we, we of course, read the company's policies and we, we read their CSR reports, but that is not what carries weight on us. It's, it's, we really try to find out what's going on on the ground. And uh, we tr see what is the damage, are people livelihoods affected, and what has the company done to alleviate impacts. So what, what do we assess? We assess whether forest or peatland will be converted. To what extent the license area overlap with areas of uh, ecological uh, values, important ecological values. Which consequences the conversion of forest has for endangered species and habitats and for peoples living in the area. And whether the company's measures of course are sufficient to maintain these values. Uh, and uh, the lessons learned, of course, all companies claim to manage their concession sustainably. And, uh, but what this actually entails is often not well understood, we think. 
So companies commission HCV assessments but cannot judge the quality. And I've read a number of HCV assessments which are of really poor quality. Uh, and they contain little information on the biodiversity that will be lost and impacts are not dealt with. Uh, we have found illegalities, we have found that companies are clearing HCV uh, areas which they claim to be set aside. And, uh, and we also find the development of deep peat here in Indonesia and um, the clearing of intact forests. I was coming to the impact too, so thank you for, for bringing that up. But I do have a follow-on question to you as well. And that is that who decides what is ethical and not? Because obviously we, we may face situations where there are different views here, depending on which set of stakeholders you ask. Um, I'm not saying that the things you mentioned should be questioned, but I'm saying that there, there may be a discussion whether it is the, um, uh, in this case, the, the Norwegian Parliament or another uh, arrangement that decides what is ethical. And also in that context, are these considerations related to international commitments of, of any kind? So I'll leave that, that, that with you for a, a second round. Now, finally, Nguyen, in Vietnam, investments in sustainable landscapes. Um, this is a very large issue for, for your country, and, and I'm really curious to hear what the priorities are, what the sectors are, and, and what the expected returns are from, from your investment uh, schemes. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. This is my honor to be here to uh, speak about uh, Payment of Forest Environment Services in Vietnam, shortly called PFES. Uh, on this occasion, I would like to talk and to share with you about some items first. So how to recognize the importance of PFES in terms of understanding and addressing raising in this aspect. Second is how to initiate activity related to PFAS in Vietnam, or means what we are doing now. And third, is we would, I would like to talk about the, what are the main achievements and lessons learned, uh, what we are doing until now. And so lastly, we would like to say about the, what we are facing now, mainly in uh, the major challenges in, in, in PFAS in Vietnam. As you know, uh, Vietnam has high potential in PFAS, particularly about the, with watershed management and hydropower. And we also uh, recognize that Vietnam has become one of the first countries in Asia to initiate the PFAS scheme. And we uh, recognize that the goal of, P, of the PFAS in Vietnam is uh, to improve the forest quality and quantity, and increase the national investment in forest sector, and reduce the state financial burden for forest protection and management, and improve the social well-being. We come up to the uh, uh, to the, the field, which field we are uh, mentioned here, and which activity being paid for uh, environment services. The first, firstly, hydropower plants pay for services for soil protection and reduction of erosion and sedimentation of the reservoir and river. As you know, in Vietnam, have a number of uh, hydropowers. It's about 200 hydropower. We uh, uh, are considered is uh, uh, service uh, uh, user manage about um, more than 4 million hectare forest. And secondly, it's a clean water production and, sup and supply companies should pay for service for regulation and maintaining, maintenance of water sources for clean water production. Thirdly, it's industrial manufacturing facilities that use water dry directly from water sources must pay for services. And lastly, is ecotourism company should pay for landscape beauty and biodiversity. And now we have some <coughs> achievement and lesson learned from implementation of PFAP in Vietnam. 
I would like to say here the government of Vietnam has made very strong commitment. In within only 10 years, uh, uh, there are 20, 20 legal instruments like decree, decision, and circular form the legal basis for PFAS implementation in Vietnam. The operation of PFAS, uh, PFAS released heavily on forest protection and de development fund. Now we have established already about the 35 uh, forest protection and development fund in 35 provinces in whole country. And PFAS it creates about uh, 100 million US dollar annually and pays for about 300,000 households who are managing and uh, protecting around 4 million hectare forest. PFAS implementation has resulted in a stronger capacity for government agency and public awareness for of the role of the forest in protection and de development. Besides about the achievement and good lesson learned, now we are facing some uh, major challenges. The awareness in enforcing PFAS contracts were identified as the shortage of human resources and staff capacity in local government department. And we are lacking of the authority of enforcing com compliance. Befet payment and opportunity costs opportunity cost are still an uh, important question. You know, the street to PFAS scheme is high opportunity cost of converting forests to other land use. The transaction cost of PFAS might be high because the forest owners are individual households and local community mainly living in remote area where are very uh, limited in capac capacity of public services. The monitoring and evaluation, evaluation system PFAS definitely needed but are not available now. However, finally I would like to say, to emphasize, in Vietnam PFAS as a new initiative for forest sector and it creates the innovative financing mechanism for forest development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nguyen. Um, this is what I would call a win-win situation. You achieve hydropower and you protect the forests. Um, but you mentioned some, some um, complications in this process, that it, it comes with uh, high demands on administration, high demands on, on verification. So the question I will park with you for the, for the next round is, mm -hmm. what, what, what do you see as the um, institutional and technological developments that need to happen to make these kinds of payments, uh, incentives, investments um, um, more effective? Okay. Thank you very much for the first round. What I'm going to do now is to take one shorter round where you get the opportunity to respond to my feedback question, and after that we will open the floor for, for questions, including I think we will have possibility for online questions. We are not sure about that at this point. Okay, so coming back to Sana, I, I asked you whether there is much space for direct investments in, in land use from the public sector or we should rely entirely on the private sector for that part? Sure, sure. thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question. Um, no, we cannot rely entirely on the private sector. I mean, the, so far to date, these services that are protected by landscapes are public goods and, and there is no and therefore, there is a need for the public sector to continue to invest in maintaining and, and restoring those landscapes. But there are several reasons why we can't just rely on the public sector. One is, as you know, public finance or public sector um, contributions or, or um, allocation of funds to environment sector is very limited. In, in most countries, it's 
one or less than one percent in some countries if you're lucky you get two percent of the public investments going into environment natural resources so so it's it's very limited um, funding secondly the you know in many countries the public investment is topped up with donor financing and many of the investments in conservation are financed through donor projects and, and that is also not a reliable or a, sustainable solution because donors' priorities change and donors' uh, contributions may vary over time. So you can't rely on donor contributions or donor financing for sustainable landscape management in perpetuity. So that's another reason why we need to really look into private investment in, in landscapes. And thirdly, it's a more fundamental issue, which is that the, the reason that um, these we don't recognize the importance of conservation and, and sustaining, managing landscapes is, is a market failure. It's the, rec the lack of being able to quantify and to, to internalize the cost of the, the benefits and, the, and the, the cost of managing those landscapes. And so um, th this needs to be addressed fundamentally. And I think there's a, good, there's a lot of good work happening in terms of improving the system of environmental, assess, uh, environmental accounts um, and so on. But fundamentally, we need to be able to internalize the, the benefits as well as the cost of, of, um, of not managing or, or managing landscapes and then be able to pay for that. So, so for, for all those reasons, I think, yes, the pu public sector should continue to play a role, but I think for longer term, and, and I think the trend has been as we know, it's a, it's a, we, we have a losing battle on our hands uh, with the competing pressures on these landscapes. And therefore, unless we find more sustainable and alternative sources of financing, we, we, we stand to lose in this game. So instead of uh, fighting the wave of private finance, we should surf that wave. Exactly. OK, thank you very much. Um, so, I came back to you and asked you, how will you verify the success in your landscapes? What are the measures and, and how will you apply them uh, to, um, shall we say, fulfill the conditions of the, of the credits or, or, or the support that you're providing? Thank you, Peter. Uh, first of all, I'd like to come back to your uh, earlier questions about uh, the scale of the projects. Uh, as because I, in my earlier illustrations, I mentioned about 100 kilowatt small micro hydro. Actually, our project is not focusing on, focus ranges from micro to mini hydro for renewable energy, so up to 10 megawatts. So uh, 10 megawatts, five, 10 megawatts is sizable projects. So we are not focusing only on small uh, 100, 200 kilowatts, but up to uh, 10 megawatts, because we cater not only for community grants, but also for commercial window projects. Uh, above 2 megawatts, we consider it commercial scale, commercial window. So we are going to cater to that. We have one of the four windows that we are preparing to launch. One of the window is to, uh, to cater to the uh, uh, private sector uh, commercial investment. And then um, how we measure the success, we have the uh, minimum ERR, economic rate of return of 10%. So this is every investment that uh, we'll, we'll take, we do proposal intake, uh, our team will evaluate the ERR, if it shows at least 10%, that'll pass the, uh, the bar. So that's the... Uh, how we measure. And about compliance, we are developing an ESMS, environmental and um, social management systems, and we have a strong uh, MONEF system. That's how we uh, monitor the success of the projects. And then, <clears throat> uh, last question from you is about how to keep the cost down, to make sure that we, we, we get the most bangs for the buck. Uh, our grants will be competitive grants. Um, so we compare, we have um, 
allocated amounts of funds for each window, and we do it competitive, uh, competitively through many, many checks, and then including the investment committee that will decide. Um, that, for example, for commercial window, I'll just give you an example how we want to make sure that um, the best project, the most cost-efficient project, gets funded. For the commercial window, we, <clears throat> of course, this official announcement, more detail will be com coming later. Uh, for commercial window, we are preparing for a uh, type of funding which is actually part of public funding uh, called VGF, Viability Gap Funding, which try, we will make projects that are economically feasible but not financially viable becomes financially viable so that the profit capital can come in. So we are going to have a, 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 a bidding for certain projects. Uh, if bidders who can come up with the lowest VGF, the lowest grant per megawatt produce, that will be the winner. That's one uh, scheme that we are preparing to launch uh, in a few next few months. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. It will be very interesting to follow. Now, Hilde, um, whose ethics are we talking about? Who decides what is ethical or not? Uh, the politicians, I would say. <laughs> um, the, the council's mandate has been endorsed by the parliament, Norwegian parliament, actually. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit more wide-ranging than what I, what I said in, in my presentation. Because it's twofold. It's, uh, uh, there are certain products which the fund should not be invested in. And this relates to uh, or, uh, companies that produce nuclear weapons, anti-personal landmines, and cluster weapons. And then there is a tobacco screen, too. And then it's, uh, it's a um, uh, requirements based on the company's behavior, not on what they produce, but how they behave. And this is then what I said, the companies which are causing or responsible for severe environmental damage, serious human rights violations, gross corruptions, and then serious violations of individual rights in war and conflict. And if nothing else fits, then there is a, a paragraph is, which says other ethical norms. So, uh, but, but it's important to note that it should be severe, serious, gross. I mean, it's, it's only the most severe cases which we assess. And then, of course, how is this made concrete? What is a severe environmental damage? And this has actually been a work done by, by the council, by the discussions with the council. And on this, in this work, we rely very much on international norms. Uh, with regard to, to forests and forest degradation, we of course have looked into all the uh, international initiatives aimed at reducing the deforestation of tropical forests, I mean the Norwegian initiative, the moratorium. So, so we, we try to align with what is accepted internationally. With regard to human rights, some of you may be familiar with the guiding UN guiding principles on business and human rights, how it is expected business, um, business should behave. Uh, we use those, so we, 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 we are not a front runner on what is ethical or not, we are actually quite conservative and we try to, to, uh, to be in line, as I said, with what is, seems to be internationally accepted in these areas. Yeah, Great. thanks. Thank you very much. Um, finally, Gray and I, I, I asked you to elaborate a little bit on the mm effectiveness of the financial transactions and, and the compliance to, to, to those um, uh, recipients of, 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 of funds and if the, you see any needs for uh, developing those processes. Yeah, uh, first I would like to say something related to how to get the win-win, uh, both parties. One of the parties is a service provider, a uh, uh, forest owner, like the individual house or community or forest enterprise. And the other party is a service user. 
we defi define the hydropower plant, for example. Uh, but in order to get the win-win of both parties, uh, we need the first one the, uh, win the commitment, not only f for two parties, including government. The first government has to carry out the, the legal framework to ensure to get the benefit, uh, to ensure uh, the both parties here to get the benefit. And we need commitment from the forest owner and, uh, and, and uh, forest, uh, forest owner like individual household or, or community and, uh, and hydropower plant. They have to sign contract and follow this contract. Uh, in order to reduce the transaction costs, we set to up the, we set up on the forest protection uh, and development fund. This can be held. It's an equipment or tool to help to reduce the the transit, uh, tra uh, uh, transit costs. Uh, because you know uh, the forest owner in Vietnam mainly are the individual household. We have more than one million forest owners. They are living in the remote area, and whereas I talk here, they they are in the area where very limited in capacity in uh, service uh, attention, for example. Therefore, we have to increase capacity building for people working in forest protection and development fund. Mm. Thank you very much. Mm. Great. Uh, I would like to open the floor. We have about 25 minutes to take questions and, and replies from the panel. Who would like to start? Please introduce yourself. I'm Paul Chatterton from WWF. Thanks for an excellent discussion. Uh, a question to Hilda and Sanath. Uh, the, and particularly, Hilda, the approach of the fund at the moment is to do least harm, and I understand that. But uh, do you see opportunities for doing greatest good? What are the chances for the fund to invest in in positive approaches and particularly sustainable landscapes for green growth? Uh, I understand that it's not a uh, that it's quite a conservative institution. So if that's not possible within the fund, what do you personally think is uh, are the possibilities for making this work with with other funds around the world? And Sanath, uh, perhaps you have some. Uh, some suggestions on this also. Thank you. I think we can take a couple of questions, give you some time to think about the answers. Uh, so we have one question here at the front, and then another one here. Hello, my name is Emmy Hafil. I'm also a member of the Investment Committee, National Investment Board. I am asked to be res for, how do you call it, to advise the chair on sustainable investment. So that's why I'm in this room. Okay. Um, I've been since yesterday and I would like to ask this question for all of you, all of the panelists, about uh, regarding the palm oil, because this is the major concern right now. Uh, the chair of the uh, investment board would like palm oil to be able as a commodity to be discussed in OPEC, but it's very difficult because it is considered as unsustainable uh, uh, palm oil in Indonesia. So, um, you know, it's only big companies because requirement for sustainable palm oil plantation is uh, uh, it's a lot of money. So um, my question, uh, listening to you, Hilda, you know, so many, how do you call it, so many requirements, so many um, conditions for you to invest. And we have so many small companies that actually work on palm oil. And how can we help them to move from unsustainable practice right now to sustainable practices? Big companies, we can, we can. Like Sinar Mas, they can, you know, because they're concerned about the perceptions, it's okay. They can move easily. But the small company, they, I don't think they have the capacity to do it. So how can investment, a uh, bank, a uh, financial sector can help on this? Thank you. Thank you. We have one question at the, at the front also. Um, no, sorry. Here first, bro. Um, 
thanks for that question. It goes back to the scale of the interventions and, and the transaction costs. Thank you. Please. Yeah. Um, Sujit Raj and the Kuhn Farm Department of National Park, Wildland Conservation, Thailand. Thank you for the panelists for the very, uh, very great uh, contribution and presentation. I would like to pose the question to the Green Prosperity Project that they very interesting. First question is whether this initiative they uh, provide the support for other country apart from Indonesia. The second one is they very interesting that the investment to provide renewable energy uh, to and to reduce the illegal knocking in the in the community. I would like to know how to sustain to, to sustainability, so to ensure that illegal locking will not take place later on, how long it takes for the project. And, and for the second one, this is for the Norwegian lady, that they, you mentioned about the, the private sector, sometimes they did not have the transparent and good uh, report as it occurred in the ground, how, how your, in, your your fund, the pension fund, provide a, somehow the verification to ensure that whatever the company do in, on the ground, especially in the, the drop country, they not create the driver of deforestation and how to ensure life verification process. And uh, the last one for the Vietnamese the, uh, minister that they would like to know that how you mentioned they that the income from the hydropower investment may not be uh, enough in, for the community. Whether it's possible that you make the integration of the past investment as the non-carbon benefit and use rate at the more income in for you know, additional income for the community. Thank you. So we had one more final question for this round, and then I'll ask the panelists to, to give some uh, answers. So uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, so I have uh, two questions. First, a uh, general question for all. Uh, uh, we know that uh, investing in landscape will for not only uh, green returns, but also for very long-term benefit, I think, uh, in terms of like, social, environmental, and economic uh, aspect. But uh, in the context of uh, our developing country, so uh, with a very, very short uh, vision, so uh, how to find the investor and who will be the investor, a government, a stakeholder, or everyone will, will be the investor for that. And the second question uh, for the project is a um, green uh, prosperity uh, project. So what is the outcome of the project? It also, it's a kind of like a, uh, invest for like a green return project. Thank you. Can you please introduce yourself also? Can you please introduce yourself? The second? No, no your name. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm uh, Doi Bui. I'm from Vietnam Forestry University. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Shall we take it uh, from uh, uh, audience left to right? So please go ahead. Sure. Okay. I think I can answer um, a couple of questions that were asked, but I think they were directed at all of us, so I'll, I'll take my step at it. Um, the question from the WWF colleague about um, whether, if I understood the question, it was about whether funds can directly invest in, in sustainable landscapes, um, and, and the question was whether um, the Norwegian fund, for instance, would, would consider something like that. I mean, my own view is, yes, I think, um, we, we should be looking at developing financing instruments for private sector to invest directly in um, private sector mainly to directly invest in, in sustainable landscape management and, and in min some cases that might be uh, setting up a fund. Um, and, and in yesterday's session um, there was a presentation by um, Lou Munden, I don't know if um, some of you might have attended that session, where he, he was explaining the conditions that the private sector would consider being uh, necessary for 
uh, investing in in some conservation initiatives, and and he identified you know several constraints um, that need to be addressed. So, for instance, if you're investing in um, sustainable landscape management, we need to look at longer period of investment, for instance, because you, you won't get the returns at the same the period as you would in a high investment, high return investment like uh, a commercial crop. Or you might also want to look at um, the interest rates because again, the, the benefits are over a longest period of time. So, so in order to, to, uh, to generate a profit, you need to be able to consider lower interest rates. And thirdly, um, because of the nature of some of the returns from its sustainable landscapes, um, you may need to look at variable schedules for payments because you won't get regular payments coming in. So, so these are some of the, the costs, or if you like, the transaction costs if you, of of um, a fund being able to invest directly in landscapes. And, and there are ways to sort of handle those by creating or bundling uh, investments into its larger um, funds. And therefore, so the, I would say we need to look at those. And it, it gets to the point that, Peter, you raised earlier about the transaction costs. So we do need to try and minimize transaction costs of um, investing in landscapes, and, and there are mechanisms to do that. Okay, um, the, there was a question about oil palm and uh, whether it's sustainable or, or whether we should, um, or, or not. And I, I mean, I, my own view is you, you, yes, you can't simply reject um, monoculture crops and, and oil palm, as we were heard yesterday from several speakers, is creating, you know, is, is contributing substantially to in employment, to, to economies, and therefore it is something that we need to, to be able to, to um, support. But the question is, how do you minimize the impacts and, and of oil palm um, and, or any other site of monoculture crop, as, such as oil palm? And, and so there are mechanisms that we should look at, for instance, to reduce the impact on biodiversity or on ecosystems as much as possible by improving the cropping uh, or plantation regimes and, and other measures. And if there, are, if there are still impacts that you can't avoid, then look at ways to offset those impacts by, um, by creating other opportunities for these oil palm companies to invest in sustaining biodiversity in, in another landscape. So for instance, going back to my example of uh, Harapan, which is surrounded by oil palms, I mean, if only the, the province of Jambi took a decision that oil palm companies should pay for some, some of the biodiversity that has been lost due to conversion of land to oil palm, and that fund then supported the conservation efforts of um, landscapes like Harapan, you would both get, you would get win-win situations. You'd get oil palm being basically sustainable uh, and creating no net loss, if you like, of biodiversity, and then you also get support for financing of landscapes like Harapan. So that's, good. that's an example of what we could do. Okay, thank you. So, there were a few questions that I think related to your presentation. Sure, thank you, Peter. Our first question from Ibu Emi Hafield. Uh, it's a pleasure meeting you, Ibu, after almost 25 years since our graduate school years in medicine, <laughs> meeting here. Thank you, C4. Yeah. Um, my um, reply to you may not uh, directly reply or answer to your questions, but I would like to uh, offer what we will do related with uh, palm oil plant plantations, related to our GP project. Um, it's true that in some of the landscapes that we will be working, there will be, there are already existing plantations. What uh, we plan to do is, in terms of renewable energy, we are introducing, um, we are using uh, the uh, palm oil mill effluents, POMI, and convert this POMI uh, into energy. Um, so instead of 
letting the methane go up on the air, we capture the methane and then convert into energy. Our calculation is one uh, oil plant, a palm oil plant, can produce up to three megawatts. Uh, so that's uh, one thing that I would like to offer. It's not answering to your uh, uh, questions. And then to the lady from Thailand, uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, first question is, is the MCC funding available to other countries? The answer is yes. Uh, however, I would refer you to the MCC website. I'm here to represent MC Indonesia, but I have MCC colleagues sit, sitting next to you. Uh, they can uh, tell you where to look for that information. Uh, other Asian countries that are, uh, have partnership with MCC is the Philippines, Mongolia just finished, and Indonesia. Uh, and then uh, the next question is about how to ensure that illegal logging will not happen again in the future. This is what we do. That's why uh, I explained what three S's and one big S. The big S is the spatial certainty where we do in, in the um, <clears throat> handout that we give you, we have this what we call PLU, participatory land use planning. And this participatory land use planning, we actually uh, involve the community to set the boundaries. Uh, for example, in some areas, we are going to, uh, we are part of the project uh, activity is to um, establish community forest. Once we establish community forest, then that protects that area, you know, uh, because no more than one rights is can be granted to on a specific land. So that's one thing. But also, before we go into the area, uh, by the way, what we see one landscape in particular uh, uh, typically uh, covers about two to three, up to two or three sub-districts, and typically within one watershed uh, area. Before we go into one district, we actually sign an agreement with the local government, with the district heads, with the provincial governor. This, we are going to invest in your area, but this is what you should do. You are committed to do this. You, we, are com we are going to do this. So part of their commitment is to uh, protect the, is to manage the land, land use, making sure that this will not happen. Because otherwise, if this is not protected, if the upper catchment is not protected, then the renewable energy, the run of river hydro, will not sustain. So that's how we ensure this. So this is a, a multi-pronged approach to secure the investment. And um, the question from the gentleman from Vietnam, uh, what is the outcome? What is the return? Who enjoys the return? In our case, um, in MCA Indonesia project, our motto is re reducing poverty through economic growth. We are investing to that community, and who enjoys the return? The people of that community. So uh, we are using the word investment, but uh, we are not an inf we are investors who don't expect to enjoy the return. With our return, we'll be very happy if we can put more money in the pocket of the people. So they will be the beneficiary of these projects. Over to Thank you. Thank you. Hilda. Okay, I try my do my best. Um, the question about the um, positive investments of the um, of the pension fund, um, I think also some uh, answered quite well on not on the pension fund but on the problems in general uh, with the with investing in landscapes. Uh, I just want to add that the, the question of positive investments is an ongoing uh, of the pension fund is an ongoing debate in the Norwegian Parliament. And there are a number of um, politicians and also NGOs which want, who want to use the pension fund as a mechanism to um, promote renewable energy, to pro promote development in uh, certain countries or emerging markets, and, uh, and all other kinds of, um, of investment. Uh, but there is also a, a counter-opinion which says that you should not use the pension fund as a means of promoting for Norwegian foreign policy. So uh, I think as the situation is now, 
uh, I don't think that uh, the time is, is ripe for, for, um, invest, uh, for, for positive investment in landscapes of the fund, but there may be other mechanisms or other funding opportunities from the Norwegian government which, which may be uh, useful to explore. Um, then there is the, the question about um, how to help small companies. That is really a difficult question and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm the right person to answer this. I, I only have a, some, a, a few reflections maybe. And that is what, what I've seen in the, in the work we have done is that there appears to be, as I said, a lack of understanding of the, of the environmental and social impacts involved often with the, with conver the, the conversion of land. Because it's, it's a very high impact of variations with, with uh, possibly very adverse consequences. And, and the understanding of this seems, seems to be low sometimes. So I think it, just to, to, to uh, build capacity to try companies to to have them to understand that this is really important and this is something that their customers really uh, will assess is uh, is important to to convey to them. I mean, this is not an easy operation, and I don't think it's it's palm oil in itself, which is a is a bad product, but it's the way how you produce it, which which is questionable. Um, so. Capacity building, I, I, I'm, it's a long shot, I don't know. Uh, then there is um, uh, the que your question about verification, how to ensure reliable verification processes. I think, uh, I think the framework for verification is quite good, but the problem is often the quality of the assessors. So, so there, should be, uh, there should be more stringent requirements, capacity requirements, competence requirements to how you really assess, for instance, high conservation uh, value areas. And, and what we've seen is that it, it appears that you also need, because, I mean, the biodiversity in the tropic is, is so different from country to country, from place, region to region, that you also need to have local, uh, as a scientist with local knowledge about this. So, so the requirements of, to, uh, to assess or the, to, to um, to have a high competence is, uh, I think it's quite crucial. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, Goyen, you had a few questions yeah. that uh, related to your presentation. Thanks, uh, question uh, of a lady from Thailand related to how to ensure sustainable relationship between service provider and service user in terms of uh, payment of uh, service, uh, environment uh, service. Uh, I, I would like to say here, is it very important if we develop one monitoring system? Especially, we should develop the tool, indicator, and criteria of um, MIV, monitoring, uh, reporting, and verification. This is very important. This is from my experience in Vietnam. Based on this uh, service provider, can provide what they, can they show what they are doing. How do they manage or protect forests? And so the user can see it and can ensure that the forest can provide more environmental service. This is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're approaching lunchtime. I'm sure there are plenty of products from monocultures waiting for, for us. <laughs> um, I would like to thank the panel very much. I think we, uh, you and the audience, you've helped us to unpack the, some of the matters around investments. Perhaps looking at the uh, investments in the landscape uh, uses and products as a whole, rather than looking at them piece by piece. I think there, is, there are some interesting opportunities in this. We heard about important uh, policies and processes, initiatives in, in this direction. And, and um, I look forward to continue this debate in another forum. So thank you very much.